Thank you, Matt, for leading us in worship. That is uh, pretty powerful things to say, pretty powerful things for you to say and for me to hear. Um, before we jump in, we're going to be in Genesis 26, if you want to turn in your Bibles there. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. We will have it on the screen behind me. Uh, but this is just kind of um, a little extra uh, thing that I want to give to you this morning. Um, this week, I, I hope God gives you little nuggets throughout the week. Um, and this week, he uh, directed my attention to Psalm 92. Uh, you should check it out. Just write it down. Check it out. This is a psalm they sang to each other every day, Sabbath, every, every Sabbath day. I'm just going to read a couple verses. I hope your heart gets what this is. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. Amen. To sing praise to your name most high, to declare your faithful love in the morning. We're doing that this morning, right? And then he says, and your faithfulness at night. To be able to get up in the morning and thank him for his faithful love. To be able to lay our head on the pillow and be thankful for all that he's done in our lives. And then he ends, he says a ton of things. And at the end, this is what I hope someday somebody says about me. The righteous thrive like a palm tree. Not because of things I've done, but because Jesus makes me righteous. They grow like a cedar tree in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They thrive in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age, healthy and green. <laughs> Don't you want to be healthy and green the older you get? Yesterday, I helped my son put together a floor in his garage. I don't feel very healthy and green this morning. <laughs> I feel tired and old. But you, know, you get what he's saying there? As you walk with God, even when you get older, you can be healthy and green. And he says, why? To declare the Lord is just, he is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in my God. Amen? Man, I just, so as I was getting ready as, to come up here, as we're singing the songs we're singing, I wanted to give you just a little extra thing before we jump into 20, verse, uh, chapter 26. So are you there? Are you in chapter 26? All right. At least one of you is. Um, so before we kind of look at this, I just want to put in your minds again where we've been. We've been traveling through the book of Genesis and one of the things we need to remember is, is that Moses wrote this book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and the timing of it is 400 years-ish behind actually where we're at in Genesis, okay? And Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is writing these things down, and he gives them to the people of Israel as they're getting ready to go into the promised land. Now, these stories are history. We believe that here at High Point Church. Their history. But the intent of the stories is for these original readers to grasp some things about their God as they're going in. To learn from the examples of um, Adam and Eve. To learn from the examples of um, Abraham, Isaac. To learn from the example of Noah, even before. Okay, and so as we look at this chapter and as we continue, just to remind ourselves that these original readers, as they're reading this, some things there, I call it spider sense. Their spider sense starts tingling as they're reading these things, okay? So I just want to put that in your mind as we start going through. Last week, Greg uh, went through chapter 25, and we were introduced to Isaac and Rebecca's kids, Jacob and Esau. And we learned that as she was pregnant... Um, there was a battle in her womb. She had twins. Now, ladies, if you haven't had twins, you know that even with one baby, you start to feel, they, they get big and they're moving around like, oh, oh man, don't, don't press there, right? Okay, well, she's like, there's a battle going on and the Lord comes to her and says, yeah, you have two babies and they're, they're, they're nations in your, they're at war. They're fighting each other. They're just, and as they come they're born, there's just going to be all this tension in your family. And we looked at a really tense time. They're, they're older, 
Esau is becoming a, a man who follows after his appetites. He's a man who is very worldly, okay? And he begins to despise his birthright. But we are introduced to Jacob, and he takes advantage of a situation to get his brother to sell his birthright, and it's just, ugh. And so we're going to, in the next coming weeks, Greg's going to kind of flesh out this crazy, you know, brother relationship, right? So 26 is kind of interesting because you just kind of blip and it's like, okay, well, now we're going back to Isaac, all right? So let's go ahead and look at this. What we're going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to read through, and as I read through, I'm just going to give you kind of like my section headings. So for lack of a better term, those are kind of the points, and then we're going to look at how, how would the original readers process this, and then how should we apply it, okay? So here's the first thing that I see in this chapter. It's God's warning to Isaac. God's warning to Isaac. Let's see what happens here. Verse 1, now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Let's pause. So is your spider sense tingling yet? This is very interesting as we read through this chapter. A lot of what happens is in this chapter is mirrored from Abraham's life. Do you remember there was a famine and Abraham he was like, oh man, I got to provide for my family, so I'm going to go down to Egypt, okay? And he goes down to Egypt, and he starts to do these things, and you're like, Abraham, what are you, what are you doing, okay? And we're going to see, actually, his son do the same kinds of things. Kind of interesting, but there's this warning. He's getting ready to go down. He's been living in Canaan with his father, Abraham. Abraham has passed away. A famine comes, and so, hey, my dad went south to Egypt, I'm going to start heading that way. And look at verse 2. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Okay, pause. What do you think the first readers thought of when they heard the word Egypt? Boo! Danger! Whoop, 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 whoop. Slavery, bondage, right? Don't go down there. Don't go back to Egypt. You're getting ready to go into the promised land. Do not go back, okay? And he makes that warning to Isaac. Don't go down there. But we see this next. God makes this promise to Isaac. This is the next thing, his promise. Well, what does he say? It's pretty powerful stuff. He says this, verse 3, sojourn in the land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. Verse 4, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and will give to your offspring all these lands, and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Does that sound familiar? It should. Those are the exact same promises that God made to Isaac's dad, Abraham. The exact same thing. He's gone now, though. And so God comes to uh, Isaac. He's on his way to Israel, and he's like, hey, don't go there. I want you to walk with me like your father did. I was his God. I called out to him. He was living in another land. I came to him, and I said, I want to be your God. I want you to go where I tell you to go, and he did it. And I will be with you just like I was with your father Abraham. Okay, and so as these people are getting ready to go into the promised land, what are they thinking? They're thinking, God promised Abraham, God promised Isaac, we'll see God promised Jacob, and he's like, and he's promised us, and it's finally come. God keeps his promises, praise the Lord. Right? That's what they're thinking as they're going in. God's promise to Isaac. Here's the next thing. God's challenge to Isaac. Now, this is kind of cool, okay? There's a warning. Here's my promise. Let's see the challenge. Verse 5, because Abraham, your father, obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. 
The, the challenge is this. Isaac, your dad was a man of faith. He obeyed me. And so I want you to be like your dad. Walk by faith with me. He heard my voice. He heard my call. He responded in faith. He stepped out. And I want you to walk like he walked. Isn't that cool? So let's see what he did. All right, let's keep going. Here's the next thing. God's patience with Isaac. His patience. Let's see what happens. Verse 6. So Isaac settled in Gerar. He obeyed. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, Rebekah, he said, she's my sister. For he feared to say, my wife, thinking, lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. Verse 8, when he had been there a long time. Dot, dot, dot. That's, I put those dots in. God's patience with Isaac. Do you hear something familiar? Who else did that? His dad, right? His dad in Genesis 12 went through a famine. He went down to Egypt, and on the way down, he looks at Rachel. He's like, man, Rachel, you're looking good today. What we need to do is we need to tell everybody that you're my sister so that they don't kill me. They get to Egypt. The people in Pharaoh's court go, hey, did you see this new lady in town? And he took her, the Bible says, he took her into his house, into his harem. That was not a good thing. And God sent plagues on Egypt. And Pharaoh's like, what have you done? And Abraham's like, well, I was afraid. I thought you'd kill me. And, and Egypt, they kicked him out. Well, then just a couple chapters later, he goes to an Abimelech of the Philistines, and he does the same thing. He lies and says, this is my sister. And so here you have God's patience with Isaac because you know what? He's, he's being just like his dad when his dad walked according to the flesh. He's being like his dad when his dad was not being a man of faith. That's not a good thing. And so it says he was there a long time. God in his patience and his mercy doesn't just splat Isaac right away. Aren't you glad that God is patient with us? As the people of Israel are getting ready to go into the promised land, they're thinking, oh my word, God has been so patient with us. Yes, he disciplined our mom and dads, but boy, there were times when he could have wiped us out in the wilderness. He is so patient, so patient. Very interesting. So let's go on. Here's the next thing. God's protection of Isaac. So what happens? He's, he's um, being patient with Isaac. Isaac is compromising, right? He's living in fear. And this is what it says in verse 8. When he'd been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. Let's pause. Now, technically, that's a really accurate translation of the word, but it doesn't really capture what was happening. It wasn't just like Isaac's telling jokes and she's laughing. You know, he wasn't telling her dad jokes. It, he wasn't like, hey, you know, I know we're a couple of socks, but I think we make a great pair. <laughs> no, it was, the idea was they're together and he's like, they're kind of laughing and enjoying each other, and they're kind of they're doing things that husbands and wives do. They're touching each other, they're hugging each other. And Abimelech looks out his window and sees this going on. Look at verse 9. So Abimelech calls Isaac and said, uh, She's your wife, isn't she? How then could you say? She is my sister. When Abraham said it, it was a half-truth. When Isaac said it, it was an outright lie. Outright lie. He says, Isaac said to him, because I thought 
lest I die because of her. Verse 10, Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So here's this guy, this Philistine king, and God is speaking to Isaac through this man. What have you done? I'm not saying he's a believer, but he was a pretty upright guy. You would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Do you see God's protection? God's protection is this. In his mercy, he used a man to wake Isaiah up, uh, Isaac up, to get his attention. God will do this through um, uh, Samuel in Saul's life. God will do this through Nathan in David's life. God has been doing this in the people of Israel's life through Moses and through Joshua. And so as the people are getting ready to go into the promised land, look, guys, I'm trying to protect you by sending people your way to tell you to stop. Come clean. You're compromising You're choosing sin. You're choosing your sin nature, your natural desires over wanting to follow me. That is God's mercy is his protection to wake us up, to get us to come to our senses. Okay? Pretty powerful to see in these things that these people are thinking as they're going, getting ready to go into the promised land. Here's the next thing. God's blessing toward Isaac. His blessing. Look at it. So he's confronted. He tells the truth. He begins living in the truth. And look at this. Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. And the, men, and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. I mean, he, he's, he's not compromising now. He's, he's living out in the open. He's 100% honest. God uh, mercifully came to him through Abimelech and he's like, okay, yes, yes, this is, oh, this is true. Uh, forgive me. And he, he, he repents, he starts to, right? And so God, he, he begins to bless him. He begins to remain faithful to his promise to Abraham and to his promise Isaac. And the, it just starts to go crazy. So much so that the Philistines are like, hey, wait a second. They started to get jealous. They started to get envious. So here's the next thing. God's trial or test for Isaac. Okay, he gave Isaac a warning. He made a promise to him, I will be with you, I will bless you. All the nations of the world will be blessed because of you. This challenge, walk by faith with me like your father did. He's very patient as Isaac proves that he's a sinner just like you and me. He's made from dust. There's protection God blesses him. Now, okay, so Isaac, let's just kind of see. Life's been going good right now. What's going to happen when life doesn't go good? Will you walk by faith? Isn't it interesting how when we read Bible stories, that's like how it is in my life, isn't it? The people reading this for the first time would be like, huh, okay, we're getting ready to inherit the promise. It's going to be really good. The land flows with milk and honey, okay? How will we stand when we begin to have trials and testings? Well, let's see what happens in this story. Verse 15, now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth or dirt all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. Now, we need to remember, as Abraham dug those wells, he actually paid for the land. They were his, Okay, he made a deal with a previous Abimelech. Okay, and so to kind of explain that, um, Egypt had pharaohs uh, 
Rome had Caesars, there are historians and commentators who, who think that the Philistines had Abimelechs. So it could be that this Abimelech is the same Abimelech from Abraham, okay? Odds are probably it isn't. He's just kind of like, you know, you have multiple pharaohs, you have multiple Caesars, they're different guys, okay? So just to kind of, if anybody says, well, yeah, but that doesn't make any sense, how could this guy be like this old, okay? That's probably what's happening here, right? So the Philistines, they fill these wells that are rightfully Isaac's, and Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Boy, that's a testimony, isn't it? So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Let's keep going. Verse 18, and Isaac dug again the wells of water. He had to dig them out. That had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given him, them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of spring water, okay, so he has a bunch of wells, but they start digging new wells. Look at what he said, verse 20. The herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, the water is ours. So he called the name of the well Asik, because they contended with him. So they dug another well, and the herdsmen quarreled over that also. So he called its name Sitna, and he moved from there. So you see what's happening? He was in this place. He gets caught in sin. God is patient. He begins to bless him, and, and slowly he's moving away from where he was compromising. Do you see that? He's slowly moving away. God's using this trial and test to get him where he wants Isaac, all right? He moved from there, dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehavot, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. This test comes into his life. What are you going to do? Your inheritance is all these wells. Your enemies start filling up the wells with dirt. Okay, I'm going to redig them, and I'm going to start digging new ones for myself. Okay, that's good. He's, wa- he's walking. He's trusting God. He's, he's obeying. But here's another test. It's at the end of the chapter, and I was trying to figure out how to, and, and so I just, sometimes tests come in seasons. Sometimes tests, God in his mercy gives us things, and in his grace gives us things, because his job for a believer is to, he's predestined us to become conformed to the image of his dear son. And so these things are opportunities for us to become more like Jesus, to yield and go, okay, God, I have to trust you in this. I don't understand why it's happening, but I know you're allowing it. I know you are with me, and so I trust you. And so we go to the end of the chapter, and this is what it says, verse 34 When Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basimath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. The trial and test lasted the rest of their lives. These, and Greg's going to show us, like, you're not, I mean, it's just like, holy cow. These two, and Jacob, he wasn't perfect, and you know, But Esau, (laughs) Esau was just, oh my goodness. And and Moses writes that, hey, this trial and test is just. So know that going in, going into the land, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a bed of roses. Be careful. Hang in there. You will be tested, right? Right? Let's go on. Here's the next thing. God's encouragement to Isaac. And he says this, verse 26, or 23 through 25 says, From there he went up to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, check this out, this is so good. I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Why? I am with you. I'm with you. And will bless you and multiply your offspring 
for my servant Abram's sake. I made a promise to him. I'm faithful to my word. I'm faithful to myself. And I'm promising to you again. Don't be afraid. Don't. And so these people getting ready to go into the promised land, they're like, there are giants in the land. There's enemies here. People who have rebelled against God for hundreds of years. Don't be afraid. Your moms and dads were afraid. They didn't listen to Moses and Jacob or uh, Joshua and Caleb, and they didn't go in. Go in. It's yours. I'm keeping my promise. Isn't that kind of cool? Okay? So then, here he goes on. So what, what did he do? Verse 25. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Now, if you're like me, well, hopefully you're not too much like me because then y'all be weird. But I, I begin thinking, what is it all about these wells? And this is what I thought. This is what I thought of. What's so important about all these wells? Well, they are a source of life. Water doesn't come from Abraham or Isaac or Moses. It comes from God. He created it. Water is life. So they had just spent decades in the desert needing water to live. So all this emphasis on wells, the people's spider sense would be tingling, I hope. Water is life. When you go into the land, these wells, think of the life that I want to give you. What an encouragement to Isaac. What, I'm with you. I love you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Right? And here's the last thing, God's provision for Isaac. When Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahazath, his advisor, and Phicol, the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and you've sent me away from you? They said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. Again, don't you see the testimony that Isaac's starting to have? His neighbors are saying, you know, we kind of sense that God's with you. Let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Don't you wish that people say that about you? You are the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast. They ate and drank. In the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths. Isaac sent them on their way. They departed from him in peace. That same day, Isaac's servants came and told him about oh, the well that they had just dug and said to him, we found water. He called it Shiva. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Isn't that cool? So in this season of Isaac's life, God gives him peace. There's this provision of peace with his enemies. Pretty cool. So how do we apply this? We've kind of shared some things like what probably I would think, hopefully, the original readers would be thinking. How about this? Listen for God's voice. Listen for God's voice. He's speaking all the time. The psalmist says, The heavens declare what? The glory of God. What are they saying? They're saying there's evidence that God has been here and he's done something. And so, listen to his voice. He brings people into our lives to speak truth. He, he gives us his word. What kind of environment are you putting yourself in so that you can listen to God's voice? 
Is his voice being drowned out by other voices? Are you entertaining and inviting so many other voices into your life and am I doing that so that I can't hear his voice? I, I have been so convicted by this. Chapter, you're like, chapter 26, man, I read it. What's a, it is so convicting. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been coming and you've been hearing the truth that God loves you so much so that he demonstrated it by giving his son that he died in your place. He bore your sins in his body on the cross so that you may be healed. And God, you've heard that God calls you, he commands you to, through faith, put your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. To believe that there's nothing you could do to make God love you. There's nothing you could do to make yourself look good in God's eyes. God's already done it. It's God's way of making us right with him. That's what Romans 1, 16 and 17 says. So he takes the whole rest of the book to explain that to his readers. It's God's way. It's not your way. And maybe you've been listening and you've been hearing this, but you've been putting it off. You've been waiting. I want to challenge you. As we continue to read Genesis and as we continue to make our way through the Bible, people did that all throughout history. It's called closing your ears, closing your eyes, and, and what happens is, is as you stop listening, and as you go, eh, I'll do it tomorrow, or eh, I'll do it in another season of my life, you begin to actually, the Bible calls it, you begin to become hardened. And then what happens is, is God's like, okay, I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. And he actually judicially hardens you. But the good news is, even though it's getting harder, he still is standing with his hands open, wanting you to come, even though you're being disobedient and defiant. That's what Paul says about Israel in Romans 10. That's what Jesus said about Israel as he was coming into the, to get crucified. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, I long to gather you under my wings like a chick wants to gather and protect her kids under her wings, but you have resisted. Please, listen to God's voice. Today's the day for you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Believer, are you listening to God's voice? He's made promises to you. Are you living in them? Are you listening to his warnings? Don't let other voices drown out God's voice. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't seek comfort in the things that you used to seek comfort in before Jesus. How about this? Avoid compromise. It is so easy. So easy. Just a little thing. I'm, just, I'm not going to tell them you're my wife. Well, I mean, that's a big thing. <laughs> If I did that, man, I'd be dead. <laughs> Not by God, but by Debbie. <laughs> well, but you know how it's just so easy, isn't it? At this time, in this world, to compromise. What are the things I let, what are the voices I let in to my house? What are the things that are coming in. Eh, that's not a big thing. Eh. They could even be good things. Good things can become really bad things. Good things can become idols. Family. Sports. And we just make this little compromise. And then before we know it, it's like, what's happened? There's no joy. There's no, man, waking up and going, oh man, I am so grateful and thankful for your faithful love, God. It's like, it's, here's another one. When that happens and when God protects you by bringing somebody into your life or when the word says, hey, hey, wake up, come to your senses, return to God quickly. Repent. 
just humbly go, okay, God, I see who you are. I can't come close, not even. So loving, so forgiving, so gracious. I see me for who I am. Oh. And just in humility, confess. Humility. God, restore the joy of my salvation. In humility, God, what I've done is, is wrong. It's sinful. Forgive me. Help me to walk by faith with you. It just return to God quickly. Here's another one. Guard against enemies. We have enemies. Paul says that God richly blesses us in Christ Jesus. So he's given us a bunch of wells. Guess what the enemy wants to do? The enemy wants to take dirt or earth. What is dirt or earth? It's the world. And it wants to dump the world into the wells that God has given us. Does that make sense? So guard against those enemies. Here's the problem. The problem is, is my number one enemy is me. Paul says in Romans 6, 7, and 8, that my sinful flesh, my sinful nature is my worst enemy. And so he says, you have a choice, believer. You can walk being dominated and controlled by your sinful flesh, or you can walk being controlled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. You pick sinful flesh, you get death. You pick the Spirit, you get peace and life. Amen? Guard against your enemies. Walk by faith, being filled by the Spirit. But then also, God in His plan has created spiritual beings that rebelled against Him and they are against you and me as believers. So guard against that. Guard against it. Take little steps. What are you seeing? What am I seeing? What am I listening to? I, I, watched, I watched a video this morning of this lady who's a new believer now. And she said, I was listening to the song that I used to, every morning, kind of sing to. And she said, as a believer, I listened to what he said. And he, like, talks about he actually talks about like how the church should be wiped off the earth and God and everything. And she's like, I had no idea that that song said that. We listen to songs that the enemy is using to put stuff in our minds and we're like, Amen. and I'm just talking about the secular stuff, right? I mean, you see what I'm saying? It's just we gotta guard against that. Here's another one, we gotta keep going. Don't want you to have to break out your lunches. <laughs> Avoid living in the past. Abraham had to dig new wells. It's like this. Isaac could not live on his dad's faith. I can't live on how I was in college. I can't live on how I was when I was at my first church in Ohio for six years or how I was at my second church in Indiana for 10 years or how I was when I moved here in 2006 to Iowa. I can't, it's easy for us to think about, and uh, you know what, hey, yeah, wow. I was just, and so somebody says, hey, how are you doing? And we kind of live off of where we've been. And, and that's not, we have to keep digging new wells. We have to avoid living in the past. And the next one, we have to keep pursuing God. It's not your mom and dad's faith. It's your faith. It's not my grandma and grandpa's faith. It's not my mom and dad's faith. And they had a, a great faith example for me. I have got to pursue God. I've got to walk with him. But here's the thing, don't be afraid. He is with you. He is with you. He is your God if you've put your faith and trust in him. And all these promises are your promises and my promises. 
And someday we can know without a shadow of a doubt that because Jesus Christ died, buried, and was resurrected and is seated at the right hand of God, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, someday you and I will be raised up to be with him forever and ever. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. This world could be going to hell in a handbasket. People could be dropping like flies all around us. God is king, the earth is his footstool. Do not be afraid. Okay? And then the lot just walk by faith. We got to walk by faith. Salvation is just the beginning. Keep going, guys, right? What an amazing truth that we learn from a couple simple stories in this man's life that God used to bring his savior into the world. Amen. Praise God that he reaffirms his promises and those promises are for us as well today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness, for your mercy. Thank you that you don't change. This world changes, but yet it stays the same. God, help us to see your call to us. You want us to walk by faith with you. First, May people put their faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins even today. And then may believers just see this man, Isaac, and learn from his example. And may we walk by faith. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's, let's stand and sing. Mm-hmm.